HBC oh, Digest oh. Radio, Digest After Dark. Welcome back to another episode of Unfiltered and Uncensored Talk with young alumni from historically black colleges. Joining us tonight, or is the Morganite? Uh, Tiff about to get thrown off the show. And a special I'm guest. I'm not getting thrown off the show. A special guest. Um, <laughs> Uh, my dear brother, uh, Katie from Coppin. Um, What's going on? Right. By way of the Petty Ass Podcast, which he never shows up for, uh, but did show up for this taping. Um, so we got a we got a we got a lot to discuss. Um, it's been a while since we've had since we've had a recording, uh, but certainly a lot has transpired in the HBC community in the weeks uh, since our last uh, uh, broadcast out to you. Um, First and foremost, I, I kind of want to begin with the the story that's kind of blended. It, it's Bennett College, which we know some weeks ago uh, had their accreditation appeal and fell short. Um, has since sued uh, the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools Commission on Colleges. They remain accredited and on probationary status um, for at least the foreseeable future until they determine um, how it's going to go to court or if they're going to pursue other. Uh, accreditation options and so far uh, they are pursuing accreditation with the transnational association of christian colleges and schools um that is not old news but it's older than recent news which is cheney uh, which is also on a show calls probation uh, with their accreditor uh, the middle states uh, higher education commission and as we know cheney being uh, you know uh, under dispute one of the, the oldest hbcu in the country um, in significant financial straits, um, from most angles, more severe even than Bennett, um, and has been for years, particularly as a public institution. And this is on the heels of another uh, headline that just surfaced this week about Denmark Technical College in South Carolina, uh, which in a few weeks is under proposal uh, to possibly end as an institution as a as a degree granting institution and be reopened as a uh, career development center so we bridge the three of these topics together <coughs> to have a conversation about what we've talked about so frequently before which is how are some of these hbcus whether geographically um whether through you know antagonistic state government whatever the case may be they're dropping. Um, if you look at those three, add that to Payne College, add that to Knoxville College, add that to Morris Brown, which just hired a new president, which we'll get into. You're seeing a cluster of schools on the verge, if not shutting down, on the verge of shutting down. Um, I would ask you guys, um, and we'll let KD start uh, because he's Hold the petty Hold ass up. guest. Um, <laughs> Hold up. Before we get started, yeah. On this three thirteen day, you forgot to introduce my dear brother Lawrence Winston Coffee the Third. Did he dial in? Is that Midnight Winston? He is here. Yeah, did you get my full government though? Midnight Jeez. Winston. I did. <laughs> I got it. I got to introduce him. Well, also, no, also that he had to do with mine. Midnight Winston. <laughs> my fault. Um. Thank you. So, Katie, we'll start with you. So, uh, a number of HBCUs facing closure, having closed, um, and obviously there's this common theme of alumni which are really, really fighting it. Um, Bennett being the one that has drawn the most attention. But, what's your reaction about the the dissonance between what financially is happening to these schools and an alumni stepping in and say we absolutely can't let them go? Um. My first thought as an alumni of Cotman State University is I hope to God we're not next. Because Jesus. Cotman's enrollment Cotman's enrollment stays below whatever it is. So let's say we need 4,000 mm -hmm. and we're always in the 3,200s or something like that. Ooh. And so my thought is we are always on that line as well. I mean, we recently, when I was in school, had an accreditation fight. Thank God we came out on top. But we still had to do some restructuring. So my first thought is it's really not enough alumni to fight this battle. What is it like, like to be a we, student at a school that's going through that? Um, it depends on the program you're in because they, they don't always attack the entire school. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they just attack certain programs. So for the School of Business Management or the School of Sports Medicine, I believe it was, they were sitting there like, oh, my God, my degree not going to mean nothing. My degree not going to mean nothing. Mm -hmm. And then two years later, they rolled all of it into the, um, the School of Business and expanded that program. And that was their way of saving the accreditation for the business school and so the question is like where's the leadership 
Like, why is the leadership not being honest with its students? How are you attracting new students and not telling them, hey, you know, we are in a little bit of trouble? Right? It seems like they're just pimping the students to keep the doors open so that a certain amount of people can keep some jobs. And that's just not fair. Um, or, or is this right up your alley? We, we, how many times have we talked about it before? How the transparency about operations, about finance, about your standing, and you, you don't disclose it to anybody. But yet you want so much of a support system behind you when it's like, okay, it's do or die time. Right. I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. But again, this goes back to my overarching theory that, again... <laughs> One with Cheney, it's clear the state of Pennsylvania doesn't have a dog in the fight about if they're if they're going to make it or not. The state of Pennsylvania doesn't care. But but even even more so that again, even with Bennett, with Morris Brown, and I know we'll talk about that a bit later, but I mean it to me it's it's disgusting, it's disturbing and it's embarrassing as someone who cares about historically black colleges to see institutions who have these, you know, quote unquote qualified um, quote unquote experienced um, you know administrators but they operate with such low efficiency they operate with such low transparency and with such low integrity and so to see what Morris Brown has done to see what Bennett has done and it, I, you know I'm always a big proponent of I'm about thriving not just surviving and I agree with you to some point Jared in terms of I'd rather have 50 strong HBCUs than be at 105 or whatever we're at you know, with with this level of um, this level of operation, this level of efficiency. So it's 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 unfortunate, but it just makes me upset because, like you said, it is pimping the students. It is getting all this tuition revenue for schools that we know aren't going to exist, degrees that won't be accredited, um, and that affects communities, not just individual students. Tiff, do you think that there's a concern that if you if you let it go without a fight or you willingly give it up, that that is a poor reflection of the sector at large and the reason i asked that question is because the, the denmark tech situation there's a the, the, there's a sister a black woman who actually proposed this change to the school and her remark was look the, the forget the hbcu thing forget the degree granting thing this is a this is a facility that what it does helps us maintain revenue and jobs in this city right if we keep it as a school it's going to shut down and there will be no jobs and no revenue. At least if we keep it as something, a career development center, a technical training center, yes, you lose a school, but you still keep some infrastructure that helps power your city. So this is this is a black person saying this. This is a black person reading it for, look, we gave it a good run. It's not working. Let's do this. So the civic, the civic infrastructure can stay in place. But do you think people hold on to it knowing that it's probably not going to last? But also knowing that we you know if we don't if we don't fight for this then this is a symbol that we you know we might as well hang this whole thing up that we call hbcu um please see the story of morris brown college well we're gonna get into that in a second <laughs> like when 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 are you going to hang it up where is that line in the sand you can't consistently say or do or be like I don't want to close. I don't want to quit. That's like quitting. It's not. When you take a calculated or when you make a calculated decision based on the things that have been happening, how you maybe have not been improving, how maybe your your programs are lacking, how you maybe don't have the students that you could and you should have and they're just not coming. You have to do something different. Like I don't I don't understand why we think changing um, how we do things <sighs> mars our legacy. It doesn't. If anything, you're trying to ensure that you're going to be here in the next five to ten years, maybe longer. And honestly, this is going to sound terrible, but I thought Denmark was a career school. Well, it's a, it's a career and technical was. school. It's a it's a it's a it's a technical school it's just historically black i mean they, they grant associates degrees right um, and i'm like so what is it really a big jump it's not well it's a jump in the sense that you you won't have an operation that students can use federal financial aid and go earn a degree that they can then use to transfer to a larger institution if you get rid of that component you just basically have a 
would they? It, it's not. It a, it's like, not a degree granted. It's not a credential thing. It's like you 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 go to learn HVAC somewhere, and you get a okay. you get a you get a certification, but it's not an academic credential that you could use to get somewhere else. I would have to look into how ITT ITT Tech, Wild Tech, and friends were using financial aid um, for their students because that was a whole problem a few years ago. They were using financial aid. So well, the problem the problem with them is that ITT Tech was teaching you know d- real skills. The issue was you would leave and the industry. In which you were trying to work you with, say, get who would hire right. somebody from ITT Tech? So it was almost like you're. It was predatory, but not predatory in the sense that if people are choosing to go there, how can you fault right. the school for is, accepting your your money? My point is, they had the ability to accept financial aid, and if that's what's in question for Denmark, then clearly, if ITT Tech, Wild Tech, and France can do it, clearly, maybe there is a possibility for. Denmark to do the same, here's, but here's it's more reputable. Here's what we got to get to because the common theme with all of these is is schools losing enrollment and in a fast way. Um, Bennett went from a thousand plus down to four hundred. Denmark Tech went to from twenty four hundred to four hundred students. Um, you know, it's it, it, Cheney the same thing. Um, Eighteen hundred down to four in like a, a period of six years. So this, these are dramatic. Like they're falling off a cliff here in terms of the people that are not coming to the institution, but yet from the outside, Wentz. Now I throw this at you because you you send people to schools and you try to pair students from Detroit with schools that'll fit their personality and their skill set. Do you do you guys in the Midnight Golf program look at stuff like that and say, eh, this may not be a good fit? You talking particularly to the Denmark piece, or just no, in general just with overall, like overall? Like when you match up the students with these schools and say, you know, you ought to apply to these three schools because they fit what you're looking for. Is the research right. such that you look at their enrollment, you look at their finances, and say, well, maybe never mind. It seems like this would have been a good fit, but now that I've done a little more research, maybe not. Oh no, absolutely. So you know, we we take an in-depth look at uh, you know all of those things where we're talking about where we're going to have a you know, a child's potentially spend the next four or five years of their their life. And, you know, we tell them you're not making a four-year decision, you're making a 40-, 30-year decision about right. a place you want to go back to that you want to invest in, hopefully, when you get done, that, you know, you'd be giving money back to your, your institution and those things. So we definitely look at, you know, the, like where the, the trends are headed with that school, you know, if enrollment is increasing or decreasing. Um, those are all things that, that definitely come into the equation for us. You know, for la- last year, particularly, you know, being in the state of Michigan, there's a lot of talk about, situation with Michigan State and the things that they were going through and mm-hmm. whether or not, you know, that was a fit for some students based on the things they were hearing, their parents having concerns and having to talk those, you know, those things through with families about what was going on there. So certainly we're looking at, you know, the news wires and, and, and looking at numbers and, and, and draw in regards to enrollment and those things and, and determining whether or not it's a fit and why um, for a student. So certainly that would, you know, a situation like Bennett would be cause for concern, you know, I, I think especially now, you know, looking at what's going on there and and those would be things that we at least want to bring it to the table. We, you know, we try to also encourage them that, you know, you're making the decision for you. We'll have a, you know, litany of things that we'll discuss, you know, sitting down. But ultimately, you're going to make the decision. We want to make sure you have all of the information in front of you in order to make an educated decision. Um, can I rebut? Yeah, can yeah, I rebut to that real quick? I think part of it is, and this is my perspective, living in Baltimore City for as long as I have. I, I know for a fact that there are two powerhouses in my state. One of which is Johns Hopkins University private. The other public one is the University of Maryland. Mm. If Coppin State University was to merge with any one of those two, we're getting swallowed up and lose right. Coppin State forever. And the only reason, and and what really bothers me about that is that the state of Maryland bailed out UB twice, actually right. three times, if I'm not mistaken. And it's like they wouldn't do that for Coppin, right. but they will let Johns Hopkins come in and use that new facility. Right. And yep. so that that part of it is just kind of scary to me. <laughs> but I, but I think that's the thing that state. that's where you have to have the people respond. Like if you don't like that, if you don't like that prospect of Coppin indeed, which is like an anchor of West Baltimore, legit. Like if you don't like yes. that, then then send your kids. Then go. You know what I mean? Give back. Like it, it, forget giving back. Take that out of the equation. Go. 
how come enough enough students aren't going now we know part of that that answer is because other schools will give you more money they'll incentivize you not going to cop it the state will play a part in that by not giving cop and great degree programs same thing for morgan same thing for most hbcus but if 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 that's how you feel then vote with your pocketbook and and i don't know if there's still a stigma to hbcus though I think we, st- I think we still living in the nineteen eight late eighties nineteen nineties with a stigma that HBCUs are of caliber to some of the PWI equivalents, well. and, and we know that to not be true. We know that our students are far more successful coming out of HBCUs than PWIs, but the world at large still puts more to a, a UT or a Kansas State than they do a Morgan or a Howard or a Hampton. And that's just that's just the part of the community that we haven't been able to shape, and I don't know why. Because I guess we can't get a hard look at the numbers, or nobody really wants to do the investigation. But it, I think we we still are fighting the stigma that HBCUs aren't adequate, even though we know it's not true. Well, you and actually, so, I think. Go ahead. Well, I, let I me, think part of that too, though, is we got to start to stop thinking about things like it's apples to apples because it's not. And I think we've talked several times about you know you can't try to promote our schools necessarily the same way that you would a PWI and we get out of that phase of, of trying to do the apples to apple thing you can start to hinge on the things that you do well hinge on the ways that you can be successful in getting and retention rates and the types of students and you know the, the putting in those buzzwords of urban and underrepresented and every litany of list of things that a lot of you know predominantly white institutions will talk about as far as trying to get the students there and even if you can't necessarily put the money up what are you what are you putting up what are, what's the benefits of your of sending your son or daughter your niece or nephew whoever it is you know to those historically black colleges and universities because there are things that that stick out and there are things that are really going to benefit a certain type of student and if we are if we are pubbing those and having those conversations and we're still trying to do apples to apples i think that's where it starts to fall continue to fall back and you have to do outrageous things like how you know benedict college drop in enrollment like you know, uh, uh, Elizabeth City State, you know, the North Carolina Promise, and even though there's debates about how successful or great it is, it's still doing something drastically different than what's being done, because not, we're not going to get anywhere continuing to go the same path that, that we've been to that point, that KD's saying, as far as, like, we're living in the 80s and 90s, like, it's going to have to be something different than what it is. Well, you know what? It's actually a perfect segue into our next segment. We're going to go to break real quick, and when we come back, we're going to talk about these white folks getting caught up at these uh, Ivy League schools. <laughs> Buying, buying their way in, buying their way in, buying their way in, and what are, what are the outcomes for for black students and HBCUs? This is not just after dark. We'll be right back. Not just after dark. We're back. Uh, just wrapped up a conversation about um, the struggling uh, or the struggle of certain HBCUs, and does it damage the sector at large? And now we want to talk about some of these white schools. Um, <laughs> who apparently are part of a wide ranging network of wealthy white folks who just let kids in and, and this is and this is what escapes me about it these parents are paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to cheat to get their kids in for the right to pay hundreds of thousand dollars more for them to be there in tuition <laughs> um, that if that if that ain't white privilege dog um no. but here's the angle I want to take for it for HBCUs I would imagine that there are some some of our black institutions that there there are people who will they may not pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for them to cheat to get in um but they certainly will try to work their networks to to take advantage of being a part of that hierarchy so Howard Hampton Tuskegee um, you know, those are some of the schools where a parent might call in or may call a trustee. They may call somebody they know and say, hey, you know, I got to get my kid in. But is that. I won't say is it I'm going to ask the question, is that just as bad as breaking the law to do it? But is that should that be a part of HBCU culture trying to wield whatever influence that you have to get somebody an opportunity and 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 whatever benefit that may come with whether that's a scholarship that they may or may not deserve whether that's a, a housing placement they may or may not deserve whether that's a passing grade they may or may not deserve do you think hbcus should have a part should have that um i guess influence as a part of their culture tiff since I mean, you, I would say, say, now let's start with tiff because she went with howard and she so, think it's better than everybody so they more like what? <laughs> 
<laughs> what? Should that Howard bias be a part of HBCU culture? First of all, there is no Howard bias. <laughs> That's a lie. That's number one. You just answer the question. You right. always got to put this first of all every damn time. <laughs> and again, first of all, <laughs> um, no, but seriously, <sighs> you don't have There's a response. No, this is why she's struggling I with do. this. I think I can. I think I, I know why she's struggling with this because it's not. <laughs> she might have been a beneficiary of it. Miss Rosita, shout out to Miss Rosita. Um, um, oh, that's possible. <laughs> but here's what I'm in the Howard because I busted my ass to get in the Howard. Thank you very much. Okay, so do you then think should, should it be a part of it? With people on campus so in for the, various positions. So the people who haven't done that should they have access to that experience just on the word of their mom or the word of a, of a relative? If they haven't done it. Then that's on them. Once you get into Howard or get into your number one HBCU, it's on you to make those relationships if they aren't if they haven't been established for you. Now, have I been put in situations where because people might know my grandfather or know my aunt or know my parents that people might want to help me a little bit more? Yes. Hey, me but it's up out. to me. What? <laughs> <laughs> it's an AME, AME church shout out no I'm talking about my dad's people I'm not talking about my mom but <laughs> no seriously like people but my grandfather was a very well known doctor in Detroit okay people will stop me and be like your grandfather delivered my, my son like that's been my wow. entire so like it's still up to me or the individual to solidify that relationship to build upon what's already there. Well, that's Which once you get there, but I'm talking about the a midnight golf student from anybody else, because those students build upon the relationships that midnight golf has provided for them. And you will know them and you will want to help them because they're helping themselves. Right. But that's when they get there. I'm talking about should, should I, as a father be able to call Morgan and say, y'all know my name. Now let junior in. Katie, no, that ain't okay, happening. that ain't happening. Yeah, but hold on, <laughs> <laughs> shut up. I we mean, don't gotta get into I that. Mean, that's that's all time. But but see, but but see, but there's, there's two different levels of this. Like part of it is, if Junior is qualified, if he meets the credentials, if he's falling within those averages, then yes, you should be able to make that call for influence. It doesn't mean you should give. It mean that they should do it, but you should be able to call for that for that influence. But my issue is when it's people who aren't qualified, who don't meet those standards, mm -hmm. um, exactly. who make the call. That's where I have the issue. It's right. not about people who are qualified. Can, can, can I say this, though? You can, on on. can I say this, though? Because in retrospect, this ain't happening at black schools. I, I dare to say 90% oh, of the whoa, students. Whoa, 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 whoa. If it is happening, it ain't, it ain't like... It doesn't, it, it doesn't happen hundreds in hundreds of thousands of dollars. Are we dropping money like that? Let's like, it doesn't, hundreds it doesn't, of it doesn't thousands of dollars like to that. pay for a child to go to school just to get into a school, then pay a hundred dollars. There, are, of there are phone calls and checks. They may not be checks that big, but there are phone calls and alumni checks written to those schools in Atlanta, to that school in DC, yeah. and to that school in, in, in Hampton. Like, yeah. I, I'll say that I got family members that go to one of those schools. There are people who some kids who may have some 2.5s and 2.6s. Who said, hey, I've been but on my life listen, member. listen, 2.5. You can get into right. Howard with a 2.5. But you can't get into <laughs> Morehouse and Spelman with a 2.5. Yeah, not, not, not Morehouse and Spelman. Unless, but unless no, but they, he's talking unless, about... Unless when unless when they pull your FAFSA and your household income is a quarter million dollars, Right. 2.5 going to get you in. If it says a quarter of a quarter million dollars, you may not get in. Right. Mm. See that's that, that's what I'm asking yeah. should be a part of like look higher education that's how it runs like if you're a benefactor of an institution it makes sense like okay I've been giving y'all a lot of money and you can't give my child a chance um, whether they're whether they're qualified or not that's how higher education works and I'm not talking about breaking the law where you're you you know you're having somebody doctor SATs and give a fake athletic scholarship but I'm saying because HBCUs don't have many of those those slots especially the scholarship slots available they don't have that many bids available should that be a part of our culture at all because you would think that you have you have a lot of international students at hbcus who are there they're they're 4.0 aces like they earned their way there 
And then you have some students who can afford to be there. They can pay like they between them and their parents, they can make it happen. But if you're Tiffany's if, president already said yes, he did an interview with you a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. Who is Tiffany's president? First Tiffany's of all. Tiffany's Tiffany's alumni president, Mr. Frederick, Dr. Frederick, Dr. MD, Frederick. MD, <laughs> MBA. And I'll put his full I'll put yeah, I'll put his full thing down. But no, I mean, he even came out and said, like, you know, he's incentivizing parents who can afford to pay for the tuition in cash that he'll give them a discount if they pay in cash and don't use financial aid. That makes sense. For Howard, that, that makes plenty of sense because it makes yeah, their and, bottom and, line. And, and that translates to I, as a president, am now saying inadvertently to my admissions director, by the way, the more parents who fit this criteria... More we need to accept. Get them in here. So if you, so if you're, if your mind, if you're saying as a school, we're focused on getting as much cash tuition as possible, and if someone, my, and I get, I pay for Morgan in all cash. I have no loans from Morgan. I paid all in cash. So if your, if your focus is we want more cash, then what are you going to do? You're going to discount the tuition. You're going to incentivize bringing in students who parents can afford to pay cash. How do you do that? You look at their FAFSA and you see what the household income is. And you go ahead and run that. Now, is that totally fair to some student who maybe to maybe the the student who's on the line in terms of GPA and grades on the line who's that overwhelmingly 4.0? Maybe not, maybe so. But how the other for side, the other side to that is, which I've heard President Frederick say, is the more money we can get from people who can pay, it can go to finance. It can go to kids who don't who can't afford it. Can't pay. But, and so that, we have to strike a balance. You do, but I, and I wonder how you do that when you're an HBCU. Because here's the problem: if that kid that that has parents that can afford it is a two point three, now now you're wading into some murky water, right? Because you, you're now the the discussion is we got a slot for this program in this school available, and the choice is a kid who academically has earned the spot. Versus a kid whose parents can pay for the spot. So here's but, but, what I but, do. But where is it from? No, a 2.3 from a WCAC school in D.C. is very, very different than a 2.3 yeah. from D.C. public schools or from and Baltimore absolutely. City schools. And I, and so, a step further is when I'm looking at transcripts on whether I'm going to admit a student or not, they have a lower GPA mm -hmm. and a middling uh, SAT or, AC or ACT test score report, I'm going to look at the transcript because if they've taken AP, IB, honors, dual enrollment, clearly they're hitting college readiness benchmark. Now that's a good point. So GPA doesn't matter all that no. much, but if they're a regular student who hasn't taken challenging courses, that would be a testament to whether they're college ready or not. Nah, I ain't got it for From see, the lowest performing school district in the, in, the, in the state. No, <laughs> no yeah, you, you gotta look at you gotta look at the school. You know, there's some schools though too that you know the you know the rigor from those institutions are preparing a child for the potential rigors of or student for the potential rigors of the university. You can look at those. You know, you know those. Especially if you know your, the areas you're recruiting for your school, you have an idea what those right. look like. But all of that makes plenty of sense when you're sitting from the perspective of Tiffany, who's an enrollment professional. Or you're sitting at Midnight Winston, who is a, a college entry liaison and expert. You guys know the math on all that stuff. I'm talking about when the president calls and say, um, Jared Carter is going to be submitting an application. You got it? <laughs> like that's and, and it doesn't matter what the, it doesn't matter what the math says. It doesn't matter that's what the, it doesn't matter what the GPA says. It doesn't matter what the it doesn't matter what the checkbook says. Because if the, if that school is Morgan State. And somebody calls and says Jared Carter said it, then you not acknowledging that means somebody gonna wind up in the digest in about a week. If I don't, <laughs> if I, if I don't get the answer that I want. Look, so, I, I, okay, look, you, can't, you can't use yourself as an example because like no We all know. We all know that you ain't got no pull at Morgan. <laughs> we all know this. First, first of all, Jared got more pull at Morgan than, than y'all give him credit for. He don't got no pull with Wilson. I don't got he no got pull with Wilson. Pull at Morgan. <laughs> Wilson is not all of Morgan. <laughs> Wilson is not tell him, tell him Morgan, all of Morgan. Okay. All I know that was a pretty gangster line that he dropped though. Like you don't want to end up in a dive Try me. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> you don't want a headline, bro. Let me um we're yeah. gonna switch gears real quick and this is gonna be Orz's uh segment coming up next on uh Digest After Dark. We're gonna talk about this storyline, which really isn't a storyline like I thought it would be. Um, but this the the proposed separation of the school of law from Texas Southern University. This is Digest After Dark, we'll be right back. Dodgers at the dark and we're back just wrapped up a conversation about uh rich black folks trying to buy their kids into school um, <laughs> how i have some pull at morgan um uh, just not over the president um and should that be a part of hbcu culture in light of what we're seeing with the illegality going on with um white folks trying to do with the ivy league um but we want to transition into something a little more serious and a little closer to home with hbcus and that is a, a headline that really isn't a headline um, which is the proposed, a legislative proposal down in Texas to separate Texas Southern University's School of Law from the university. Uh, the proposal suggests that the law school will operate as a standalone institution with its own board, um, its own budget, and the right to eminent domain in a certain land mass around the campus, um, effective September 1, if it passes. Um, or as you live in the third war proper uh you go to school uh not at texas southern but adjacent so we don't need to mention your pwi ties um <laughs> but you you so you're kind of like the um, digest you're kind of like the digest texas correspondent on this so can you fill us in on what you can share about what where is this story because it's not i haven't seen it anywhere else but the digest and that's crazy because i wrote it so it's not in the Chronicle. It's not in any of the black uh, newspapers down there. Where is this story and like what's happening? So right now it's really just between alumni um, of TSU and you know the people who are involved in in the space. Like I am, a lot of my classmates at my PWI uh, grad school program are TSU alumni. My corporate fellow is a TSU MBA alumni, and he also is a member of their business advisory board. So, um, or for the former class I had, not my, my, my next class, but so I've, I've had some conversations. I've spoken to my state representative, uh, Garnett, um, and I've called Dutton's, uh, office, the representative who made the legislation. I've called his office numerous times. What it basically sounds like is that, uh, and from what I've gotten is that Dutton, his position is trying to protect the university, potentially protect the law school and the law school's integrity. Um, because I think that he doesn't have faith in wherever um, TSU as an overall institution is leading. And I think that his his idea, though I disagree with it, is that if we save the TSU law school, then at least we can save that vital arm of what used to be TSU. And I'm purposely not using the law school's name because it's he's used it in the legislation as a way to separate the institution overall from the individual school of law. Um, because again, we know TSU School of Law is one of the best HBCU law schools. Some would argue it is the best um, in terms of putting out black female judges, black female prosecutors, especially in Texas, in Louisiana, and the neighboring areas. So my perspective is Dutton's legislation is basically to protect the law school at the expense of TSU um, because I believe he thinks, like many other people would believe, that there is a larger state power moving in the city of Houston. Um, they already have a medical center there that has a med school, and they offer MDs and PhDs in, in a myriad, myriad of, of sections. As we know, Howard University's president did his residency there in Houston at the University of Texas <laughs> Medical Center. Um, and then also you have a, a UT MBA program that operates in the city of Houston. And so I think that that's really what... Um, what Dutton is, is trying to protect the school, check, protect the law school from, because obviously you already have a publicly funded law school in the city of Houston, and you have a private law school a block away in six, South Texas College of Law, and you have TSU's law school. And Texas is the kind of state, state that will consolidate. Um, and obviously TSU's mission since its inception has been to try to survive against UH, and they've done pretty well at that. If UT comes along, it, their survival isn't going to be as imminent um, because of the power and the money that UT has, um, as see, we've seen what they've done in the city of Dallas. See, this is what is bothersome to me about this story. One, 
white people ain't talking about it in the news which means that they there, there's something that they want to have happen and they don't want to draw a lot of attention to it if you don't believe that try to find coverage of the maryland hbcu lawsuit up here because they've been having a whole bunch of negotiations and proposals made you can't find coverage of it anywhere um so that that is troubling that a legislative bill has been proposed to split a law school from a, a, a from a black college and ain't but so many black law schools in this country and nobody's saying a word about it that's number one number two maybe i'm stupid but tiff katie midnight winston y'all correct me if i'm wrong if a if a school got word that a larger system was coming in and and possibly going to incriminate on them steal students steal resources and all kinds of stuff and somebody said we're going to save the law school not the university but the law school doesn't that strike you as a little odd that's that's almost like you know we we go into morgan and somebody says well you know hopkins is getting ready to take over all east baltimore but let's save the school of engineering so no, I, I, I don't i don't mean to cut in real quick one thing i did want to mention just to, just for reference tsu is independent just as morgan's independent so tsu is not a part of any any state system correct unlike the majority of public hbcus tsu is independent which puts them in a different space than a PV, for instance, which is in which the is system, a part of the Texas a, which is in the Texas A&M system. But my question so, is, but te- yeah. but but UT coming in would suggest that okay, if we set up anything in Houston proper, in the in the in the anywhere in the region, that whoever and whatever has been going to TSU is probably going to go to UT. That because they're going to have the scholarship infrastructure, they're going to have the technological infrastructure, the facility infrastructure right away. They can build tomorrow. They like the, they like the Marines. And it goes they like back. the Marines, Katie. They ready to fight tonight. Right. Like, and it goes back to our first conversation: is well, how do enrollment go from eighteen hundred to four hundred? Right. That's how. That's how. <laughs> that is That's how. exactly how. Yeah, it's it's troubling because if if it becomes separated, that's even more of something that would support or create a barrier for black students pursuing a legal education at Texas Southern. Now, now, or, and, don't, and, 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 and don't forget, Texas Southern's law school is one of the most, if not, actually, I'm, I'm not saying, it is the most profitable section of the school. They make more money on law school tuition, law school graduates giving back than any other area of the school. Like, that, that is the money maker. Now, so and, you this, like, and there's some other things that we have to talk about with that too I don't mean to cut you off Tip, but I want to throw this in there there has been Texas Southern Law in recent years has been under fire because the, the, the graduates have not been passing the bar um, and so they've been criticized and the state has been critical about saying well how is it that you you know you're one of a, of a handful that we have the only one that's dedicated to minority education in law and you're underperforming so I wonder how much of this is tied to that. Like, we feel like if you if if the school was separated from Texas Southern University, that there would be a better chance for leadership, a better chance for improving. But also keep in mind that a lot of those scores are coming from prior to Lane taking over. When Lane took over, a lot of people were fired. Hit the first class to fully come in under under his his leadership, fully in terms of recruiting, coming in and finishing, won't graduate till. I mean, the 2020, either 2019 or 2020. Mm. So those standards are still based off of, you know, old cohorts. And, you know, law school, people just, you start and you finish. There's no, there's no in between. So I, I think that, that some of that has been a bit harsh. But again, the, the biggest issue, and this is for all HBCU law schools, and I know Eric and I went back and forth in the chat with this looking at the numbers, it, it's not really a fair apples to apples comparison. We look at these with these bar passive scores. But even more so, even like Tiffany was saying, access to, to, to black lawyers, I mean, there really is no other option in this area besides Southern. And then if, once you get outside of there, there's not a lot of public law schools that are going to accept HBCU students in the state of Texas. They may get into UH, but even a lot of UH undergraduate black students go to TSU Law School. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a slippery slope. But even then, just nationally, is Texas Southern it's southern it's famu it's north carolina central it's howard it's udc that's it 
Mm. That's it. That's that. That those are the only black law schools. And FAMU is program is only is, I think it's right around the ten year mark, or maybe it's approaching ten years mark of even you know uh, giving out degrees. So after <laughs> after forty years, basically, or fifty years, basically, of the state of Florida, basically restricting the ability for black students to get degrees. So we're not even really 50 years in with these schools. If you look at the act, you look, if you look at access to law, it's very, very low. We probably, we only have 10 years of the seven schools. Yes. And what I was going to say before I was interrupted was that you probably um, interrupted everyone else. If you, if you if you would cut down your intro, you give your answer, you wouldn't get interrupted. You definitely said I don't mean to cut you off, Tiff. That's true. I did. Right. I apologize. Mm-hmm. As I was saying, um, <laughs> she is so spicy. Having, having <laughs> Texas Southern as an independent school, I believe, or Texas Southern's law school as an independent law school, would create um, yet another barrier for Black students who want to. Pres- excuse me, pursue uh, a legal education or or any other um, master's or professional level education. Like, as it is, there's only 10% of black students who have, who are in grad programs in the United States. Hmm. Even with our HBCUs that have grad schools and grad programs, the number is still 10%. It should be more, Hmm. but there are barriers. Now, let's say if it did become a standalone independent law school you would need somebody out here whipping checks whipping donors getting money day in and day out Mm -hmm. and then you would still need money or still need to have specific policies in place to spend that money on students from HBCUs or other minority serving institutions to get into your law school to make it accessible they can take it, it, it okay let's say you, you you're right you want to protect the school and make it stand alone who's to say that the university of texas doesn't move in right next door and say give me that school five years from now and close and, and say you can close this undergraduate school because we just took their best program right we can say right. we can we can add them to the uh system real quick or add them to the t- to the ut system real quick and go and keep it player and that's all <laughs> that that's that's all is gonna happen I mean, again like I don't go to TSU for my graduate degree for a very specific reason. It is due to the lack of funding and a lack of innovation within the program that just wouldn't work for me as a working professional pursuing a higher um, a higher degree. But if TSU didn't, if, if they move to law school, how can they survive? I mean, I, I see the situation of separate and divide. I mean, se- I'm sorry, separate and conquer. I mean, sorry, divide and conquer. All they're going to do is divide them up and say, you can't survive on your own. You can't survive on your own. None, neither of you deserve the money. The scores are bad. Enrollment is down. We're going to come through and take this very, very, very high price, high in demand, downtown Houston land. Because let's, not, let's mm. not forget also, mm-hmm. TSU is not in Waller County. Right. It is in downtown Houston, Texas. Right. I, you know, it, it, it just goes to show you how how long people in power can can lie and wait and plan. We were talking off air about Texas did this or UT did this some years ago, and it got it got rejected. U U of H system said we don't want it. A lot of lawmakers said we don't want it. Um, but it, it goes to show you that if, if the University of Texas has anything to do with this, this is something that they've been plotting on for years. And even to draw it closer to home, Katie, how long have we heard rumors just up here in Baltimore about something's going to happen between UB, University of Baltimore, and Coppin? Man, we've been fighting that. Well, I ain't going to say we've been fighting it, but we have been on high alert about that. They've been saying it for years. It's never happened. It's never happened. Like people don't propose anything, but they've been saying it. Somebody will crop up and say something every couple of years. And it just goes to show you that these And it's always been out. And my and my and that's why I brought that up. Because it always is we need to bail UB out, not we need to bail Coppin out. Right. I'm not saying Coppin is in a great space, but I'm saying we were much better than UB. Right. Because we don't go in debt every five years to the point where we need the state of Maryland to say Give me some money, please. And UB is still struggling. On top of that, enrollment is still down. 
Um, when that actually, UT is a whole different animal though, because if they anything like the University of Maryland, then yeah, I don't see that's a hard. First of all, oh, UT, <laughs> yeah, they're way bigger, way better. Like <laughs> University of Maryland, right? They University laugh at of that. Maryland is smaller. It's smaller than UT systems number four school, right? <laughs> wow. Right. I mean, Texas is a big You got UT, you got UTSA, right. UT Arlington, UT Dallas, and UT nice. all just those four schools. It's like 200,000 students. They're probably looking at it. How, how are we not in Houston? Who says we can't be in Houston? We're in every other major city in Texas. Exactly. What do you mean? What do you mean we're not in Houston? But it actually takes yeah, us to our final crazy. topic tonight, and we're going to take our last break, and this is one we're going to kick over to Winston, um, which is some, some positive news for HBCUs, very positive news. For the first time in Ooh. about seven years, enrollment collectively at all HBCUs is up uh, for the first time in nearly a decade. So we'll talk about that when we come back. Mm-hmm. I just have to dark. I just have to dark. We just wrapped up a conversation about uh, the proposed separation of the School of Law from Texas Southern University um, and the ramifications that could have before that uh, conversation about uh, some of our struggling HBCUs and some of these white folks stealing their way into school. Um, but now we um, have some positive news. So this is actually from a few weeks back, but it's certainly worth bringing up today. Uh, for the first time in seven years, enrollment, total enrollment at HBCUs is up. Um, and what makes this significant is that for the seven years prior where we lost an average of 10,000 students a year between 2012 and 2015, and then that dropped down to about 1,000 students a year for the next three years, we're now up 6,000. Um, so it, it suggests two things. One, that uh, clearly something, something happened between 17 and 18. Um, that that Don't be silly. no, but you, see, I know Don't where you want to go, and I'm not going there. because a lot of people think 45, 45. A lot of people think a lot of people think that it was Trump. A lot of people think that it started with Missouri and the student protest there. Mm-hmm. Mm. I tend not to, I tend not to believe that, and here's the here's the reason why. And, and this is just my theory. If we were going to use HBCUs as a an expression of black pride, wouldn't we have done that in 08? And wouldn't we have done that in, in 12? Mm, why, do you, why do you wait? Or, to be honest with you, enrollment was going up at HBCUs. Although, I, you know, our record high for enrollment of HBCUs was 2011. The year before the bottom fell out with the plus loan thing, the record high of HBCUs was over 326,000. Mm. That was our highest mm. of all time. And then the plus loan thing happened and we and we dropped by four, uh, you know, maybe 38 38,000 over the next several years. But if it was if it, if HBCU enrollment was going to be an extension of racial pride, wouldn't we have done that for Obama? I tend to say no. He wasn't our president. Oop. No, like. not even, I want, I'm not going to do that. We're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. Yikes. We are not going to do that. Oh my God. Oh, I, I'll do it. Wait, who said that? Was that KD or Orr? That was KD saying. That was Orr. KD's Obama fan. Me and Orr's are not. Yeah. Winston is neutral. Yeah. Um, I'm definitely neutral. <laughs> <laughs> well, Winston, let, me, let me ask you this. So, these are, we're, going to, we're going to give you the, the kudos because you single handedly, in my mind, Help these six thousand kids get to these HBCUs. So kudos to you. Hold the um, hell up! Wow, six thousand. Tiff, you had nothing to do with it. You about to be thrown off the show. Um, <laughs> <where's> the, <laughs> whoa, 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 um. So, for, for us, you know, I think in being in Michigan, one of those those states that well, unfortunately we don't have an historically black college university in our state lines. Um, I think a lot of you know students not going in those directions, at least speaking from our program perspective, is just as out of lack of our people perish out of lack of knowledge. You don't really know what options or opportunities are available, and you know, for us, the state schools when they're hitting the kids hard, especially in those minority numbers. And they're hitting, you know, those the kids in Metro Detroit really hard, trying to 
get them to transition to to those options that they're just like, oh, I'm just going to go to Eastern Michigan because they come to my school every week. Or, you know, I know Michigan State has a bunch of black people there, so I'm going to go, you know, there, whatever the situation, whatever the, the case is. I think a lot of it for us was just the lack of knowledge. What we often find, or what I often find when you're counseling, is talking about general options for students in general, and I'm always trying to bring at least, hey, let's at least have the conversation about historically black colleges and, and what are you aware of your knowledge, how much are you aware of them, is when we start that conversation, it's like, oh, yeah, my uncle graduated from Tennessee State. Oh, I, had, I went to, to Morgan. Oh, yeah, I've heard of, you know, Morehouse or Spell, whatever the situation is. And then it's, okay, well, let's do some little bit, let's dig a little further into what's, what, what these options really are, what they bring to the table, what's unique and what, what benefits exist there for them. Um, I would say, funny enough, and you said 2011 was um, the year that, the, that it was the highest. Um, for, for us, as a, from a program perspective, 2015, for whatever reason, we had a ton of kids that year mm-hmm. who were curious about, about the option, and so much so that the Detroit Free Press, or the owners of the news of the Free Press, they did an article about it. Because mm-hmm. we had like uh, almost half of our kids, I want to say at that point, who were like just seriously looking to and were curious about the option. Um, they wanted to know why and what was you know their thought process and those kind of things. And you know, for us, I think a lot of it is just that that lack of knowledge. I mean, you would think in 2017 that there would have been way more for for that 2017 class who maybe were interested. I think it did start to change back 2016. They kind of dulled off for us, you know, from a program perspective. But then 17 began that increase, and then 18. I think for us, we had a ton from all different obscure choices that don't normally go outside of the state of Michigan, North Carolina Central, Tugaloo, and Talladega, and we had kids who were going to some of the more obscure that we don't hear as much about, you know, in the in the Power of Five or, you know, whatever top conversation of HBCU. So, from my perspective, I think a lot of it just is what you don't know is kind of the detriment to why you're not even, not even think about, you know, North Carolina Central or Elizabeth City State or, or Dillard or Xavier, whatever it is, because it's not, you know, being up north, it's not really a conversation piece for a lot of those, especially from the counselors, the counselors at their schools. Mm. Tiff, you were responsible for about ten students getting in. Um, <laughs> what, what's your What's your perspective? Uh, you- <laughs> see, hold up. See, first see, of I'm all, I'm the petty one. I'm the petty first one. of all. I'm the see, petty. first of all. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> That's the other one. You know what? Oh. <laughs> Anyways, um, no, what Winston said about students and guidance counselors just not knowing, that really is 95% of the battle. So, in terms of, yes, educating them about HBCUs as a strong and viable option, cool. But following that up with policies and procedures, mm. that's a whole other thing. Mm. And, and we haven't caught up at least in Michigan in Michigan like that yet. No. no. But I'm working on it cuz I'm I'm dead ass. Don't Ooh. invite me to your lunch. I don't want your 30 minutes. Don't invite me to I want well. your undivided attention <laughs> to this matter with right. your students, with your parents and with your guidance counselors because there's no, no that you are responsible for 500 plus students and you don't know that HBCUs are a thing. And yeah, literally. Guidance counselors who literally just don't know. That's real. I like to I like literally. to take it from a, a different perspective too. Um, I think it's a social economic thing. Okay. Are not schools cheaper than most PWIs? Right. Yes. So it's like if my in state, if you if you if you have a, a HBCU in your state and it's cheaper than the UT, the University of Maryland, the Penn State, why not just go to school where it's cheaper? Especially if you pay attention to the news. Higher education is under attack in general because people do feel like degrees are worthless, but a, a good portion of the work that you can do out of college is going to get automated. Um, and so you want this process to be as cheap as possible. There is another, and the other thing is that a lot of students are going to um, community colleges first. And so I think the guidance from a community college is a little different than the guidance from high school. Because That's a an community point. college. Yeah has a lot more connection in the area and they tend to connect with the cheaper institutions because it's easier to get those students in and they need enrollment anyway. And those programs are a great bridge between, you know, what you can do at an um with an associate's degree and what you can do with a bachelor's degree. When you see it jump that dramatically, when one year you lost a thousand students and the next year you jumped plus six thousand, I think it's not just people concerned about affordability. I think it's some students who can afford it outright saying I'm going to choose an HBCU. I don't necessarily Absolutely. think that it's it's a situation where, again, this is where this is part of our racial rebellion. 
Um, because if, if that were the case, I think in my mind, you would have seen enrollment jump, Katie, like you said, at some of the, the upper crust HBCUs. You would have seen Howard go off the charts. You would have seen Southern go off the charts. Um, you, you know, Hampton, Tuskegee, all those, Wait. those upper tier We're institutions would have just jumped off the radar like oh we're up four thousand kids if that was if that's what it was going to be but but wait 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 wait. you're talking about enrollment as in students who have enrolled not necessarily how many they admitted correct this is just this is straight up fte enrolled yeah right but like they could have what they could have admitted a large amount of people but if they don't come then they don't enroll I mean, but so but the admission thing and that that's never really the discussion because HBCUs do admit a lot of people and they, they get do. My sis, they my get a lot of got a, uh, My sister got admitted last in, in September, and she didn't even start her senior year in high school, and she's on her way to Morgan. So, admittance is not an issue, right? It's the, how many how many <laughs> invite saying, to campus to, is not a problem. Yeah, but but we're talking you you use Howard as an example. Who not who. If they get admitted to Howard, who not following up with Howard? Like that's that's um, tons and tons, quite and a tons few, of quite students. a few people. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. Hey, because you no, know, let's let's so let's let's, let's take that, that, that example. But see, but see, but see, it's, it's, it's not semester. just semester. Here goes it's Howard Bias. Knowing full well they can't pay outright. Who if they get their admittance into Howard? Who's not gonna follow up if but, but only see, one semester? So but hold see, up, wait but, a minute. But 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 again, you're taking from a standpoint of somebody. Who's going there because they want to be at Howard and Howard only? There mm-hmm. are tons of students. I mean, I guarantee you that eighty-five percent of Morehouse and Spelman's, um, you know, people who people who got in their freshman class got Howard and Spelman's letters as well, and they said, "Nah, I'm good. I'm going to Atlanta." I'm going the to same Atlanta. way, and, and, Again, and vice those versa. Those same people that have exactly those so will the same pool and experience all that they can for however long that they can is my point. But 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 the, the major difference is that Morehouse and Spelman don't have the retention. I'm not saying Howard has a retention issue, but they don't have the retention rate that Howard does. I'm gonna give you Those a perfect. Those girls oh, stay. I'm gonna give you a perfect example. There was a. I saw a headline the other day. A young lady who at 16 years old had graduated undergrad and was going to law school. She got into Texas Southern. She got into Southern. She got into Howard. She applied to several HBCU law schools. Guess where she's going? Southern Southern yeah. Methodist. Southern Methodist. Yikes! You. So Jesus to your Christ. point about would you who would turn down Howard? Apparently, a sixteen year old. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to do that. Hey, and, 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 and SMU. SMU is a SMU is a lying person who is sixteen, still a minor. Um. SMU is old money, old money, old old Texas oil money white school. Like it ain't even diverse. No, not at all. Not at all. (laughs) I got just one more point that I wanted to make that I thought about just now in this conversation. Um, A lot of how uh, state institutions, as far as like K through twelve, grow is based on federal funding. Mm -hmm. They get federal funding because they have to submit themselves to federal testing. Well. Park, um, which I think is the national test, mm-hmm. is geared towards college readiness. And so if you're going to do that, you have to tell everybody about all of their options. And so I think that's where a lot of the education about a- education about HBCUs came in, is because now I have to give these every student an option. All of this is, is it's very complex, but it comes back to one simple thing. Go to an HBCU. You do that, you <laughs> solve all the problems. It's most of the problems. <laughs> Most of them, right? There's a lot of things we got to get into in future episodes. So, with that, with that I, yeah. I appreciate y'all tonight. Like your alpha bias. Oh, God, um, I didn't. Okay. I didn't invite another alpha. Who, 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 who invited another alpha on the show? Well, he oh, okay. Because your other alpha brethren lost his damn mind. Right, and you replaced him Which with one? another alpha brother. Yes, bro- I did. For the, for the record, for the record, I am not Greek. <laughs> <laughs> For the right, <record. laughs> I didn't even leave in with the, my Greekness. I, that's not how I wanted to be identified this evening. But Tiffany won't let it go. She won't let it go. Thank y'all. Thank y'all so much. <laughs> or is the Morganite? Thank you for dispatching live from Houston. Um, 
Midnight Winston, thank you for the extra 6,000 students at HBCUs. Uh, hey, yo. Tiff, thank you for the profanity tonight. Um, you're definitely getting kicked What? Out. What profanity? Um, dear brother, thank you so much uh, for coming on the show. Not over my house for dinner, but on the show. Um, <laughs> greatly appreciate it. And um, so are we going to do this next week? or? It takes 10 minutes to get up this driveway. That's true. Um, it does. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> so are we going to try to do it again next week, Tiff? Or we got to look at uh, this. Later on Google this week because it's still spring break and we got episodes to get out. That's true. All right. Thank y'all so much for listening. This has been Dodgers After Dark on HBCDodgers.com and Series 142 HBCU, the Howard University uh, Sirius Satellite Radio Network. Thanks for tuning in. Peace.